Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alexander. I'm from Google, and today I'm going to talk about Sysbot. Um, after a short introduction, uh, I'll share some interesting statistics that we have accumulated over seven, year, seven years of Sysbot operation. Uh, then I'll share some updates that um, have been on Sysbot over the last year, and towards the end, we'll revisit some controversial topics about Sysbot operation. This year, there have been quite a few hot discussions on mailing lists. Um, okay. Uh, so there's actually a distinction between Syscaller and Sysbot. Syscaller is a standalone coverage-guided kernel fuzzing tool. Um, well, Sysbot, on the other hand, uh, is a continuous kernel fuzzing system that periodically checks out the latest kernel revisions, builds them, fuzzes them, aggregates the reports, and sends them to kernel developers. This bot uses Syscaller for the actual fuzzing. And uh, since 2017, uh, Syscaller has detected more than 17,000 findings in the Linux kernel and reported more than 6,000 of them to the Linux kernel main and list. So far, more than 3,400 Linux kernel commits directly mention Sysbot. And uh, on our web dashboard, we have recorded more than 4,800 resolved findings. So I think yeah, you might have seen our reports to mailing lists that look like this. We include information on the tree where the issue was detected. Uh, we include reproducers, console output, some VM Linux, kernel image, whatever might be helpful for you to understand the nature of the problem. And we also have a web dashboard that you can access at syscaller.appspot.com. We display all our findings there. And uh, for every finding, we display information about every time we have hit it during buzzing. So for every particular kernel crash, you can also see uh, kernel configurations, kernel revisions, console log, reproducers, they are present, and all other data. Um, on Sysbot, uh, we have 25 Syscolor instances that cover different combinations of um, platforms and kernel trees. We pass on native ARM64 and x86 emulation uh, virtual machines and Google Cloud. We pass on emulated and KVM powered camo instances. Um, and every year we've been reporting roughly the same number of new findings in the kernel, roughly 1,000 per year. For every finding, Sysbot tries to find a reproducer. It's not always feasible, uh, but 60. Uh, 4% of all reported findings had a reproducer. Cost by section is more tricky, so we managed to find it only for 23% of the findings that we reported in the main lists. And Sysbot also provides batch testing functionality. That is, you can ask Sysbot to build kernel at a specified revision and run reproducer against it. Optionally, it can also apply an arbitrary Patch before building the kernel. Mm, the number of patch test requests that we have served uh, is growing, and this year we expect no time maximum. Okay, uh, let's look at what our accumulated data says and why some Sysbot findings are addressed and some are not. Now, this graph shows the distribution of statuses of the reported findings over time since they are reporting. Uh, green area are the findings that have been addressed. And as you see, the share of addressed findings rapidly grows um, until 15th day or something. Then the growth slows, slows down. Also, of course, not all uh, findings that we reported fixed only because we reported them, so we don't really cannot really track all their state. 
So we have an auto obsolescence mechanism that kicks in to remove stale reports from our web dashboard. And as you see, it's uh, colored in orange, I think. Um, and the share also grows over time. And by the end of the first year after publication, around 20% of reports remain unaddressed. Yeah, let's uh, formulate a problem like this. Uh, so there's, suppose there is a mapping from various report factors to a simple Boolean verdict, whether the report was addressed within 45 days or not. Then we can apply some commonly used mathematical approaches to analyze it. 45 days is just a convenient figure. Almost all reports that are ever addressed are addressed within 45 days and automatic back solution um, has not yet come into effect. And using the data on our reports to public mailing lists over the last years um, and applying the both mutual information and key square approaches, um, we get this ranking of uh, features. They get the same results. Um, the most important predictor of whether an issue is to be addressed um, is the affected kernel subsystem. Um, so yeah, to <laughs> avoid any controversy, I will not mention any specific statistics here. Uh, surprisingly, a uh, very important predictor is the average daily number of times we hit crash during fuzzing on seed path. Um, then comes existence of a cost by section report time. There's characteristics of the moment when we did report the problem and the existence of reproducer. So uh, it was pretty surprising to find such a strong correlation between the number of times we hit the issue during fuzzing and how, how likely it is to be resolved. But it is. And uh, it's not explainable by higher rates of uh, reproducers or cause by sections for issues that we hit more often. Mm. Maybe if we can hit it so easily, other developers also can and it boosts priority for these issues or these are just more easier to fix than those that appear more rare. I can only speculate. Um, another surprising insight. Uh, yeah. So, so no, it's so just a short comment regarding this. So, for example, if uh, Sysbot is sending, you know, these summaries of Sysbot reported bugs, uh, like per subsystem monthly, then you know it's also sorted by the number of occurrences actually. So, and like for my personal, if I see Sysbot is hitting like this ten times, ten times, ta ten thousand times a month, yeah, then I think okay, maybe that will be something which is relatively easy to tackle. <laughs> So so let's fix this. So so I guess it's it's kind of natural that actually the, the problems that are hit really frequently get more attention and so so they get fixed earlier. And also the reproduction is also kind of the point because if you hit it so easily, then it's very likely other people are able to reproduce well, statistically, it. Statistically, I did not notice any big correlation between the share of reproducers and number of well, the, so, so the, the fact that you have a reproducer and share it doesn't mean that the maintainer is able to reproduce it on his setup. But it's when it is very easy for you to, to hit it, then likely even like some different setup is able to hit it. So I guess also making a difference. Thank you. That's very interesting points. Um, okay, so another surprising insight was the how much importance how much cost by section is more important than reproducer. Reproducer is important, but uh, it brings the probability that the issue will be addressed from 14 to 19 percent, while existence of a cost by section makes it 39 percent. Uh, and of course, uh, the report type also makes a difference. Uh, UBSAN general protection fault reports are three times more likely to get addressed as info task hunt, which is, I think, expected. Okay, let's look at um, 
the notable changes over the last year. Uh, so we have put time into improving cost by section quality. Uh, and as a result, uh, now we serve more cost by sections. We used to serve around 20%. Now it's 40% of reporting findings have a cost by section result. And by sections have become more precise. But in general, it of course remains a very, very challenging process, especially if you do it automatically. And uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, for example, many kernel regions simply do not build or boot with sysbot config. So we have to cherry pick uh, fixed commits for a number of known failures. Uh, now we also do partial conflict minimization to uh, reduce the risk of triggering not related crashes, not related build and boot failures. Uh, another problem that bug reproducers are unfortunately not always 100% reliable and uh, the reliability may depend on how far back we are into the commit history. But somehow counter that, we now try to estimate the accumulated error probability by looking at, uh, at every bisection step we run 10 to 20 virtual machines and uh, by measuring how many of them crashed or not crashed we can try to estimate our chances of having made an error. And we'd not reply, not report find by sections that are likely to be invalid. And maybe stochastic hit by sections could somewhat help here, but we do not have them yet. Um, another problem is that single reproducer might trigger several unrelated bugs. And um, for that, I'm not sure there's any automatic solution at this point uh, to minimize the risk. We said do conflict minimization. We drop unnecessary instrumentation. We ignore some obviously unrelated crashes, and it somewhat helps, but not in all cases. And uh, last big problem is that some commits do not introduce the bug, but they surface it by you know, adding an assertion or by changing the execution path and um, by section, by secting for that problem inevitably points to that commit and technically the result is correct, but it's useless. And here I'm not sure automation can ever help us. So we have to assume some risk of false positives. Uh, the next new feature is that on our web dashboard, we now aggregate all the discussions related to the finding on the mailing list. These include both discussions under the under our report and all <coughs> batch series attempts. Hopefully, it should minimize uh, the duplication of work. And this year, we have begun to automatically assign uh subsystem labels to our findings you might also have noticed it we included in it in email subjects and we show it on the web dashboard where you can filter by these tags um, if you want to see findings in a subsystem for your interest you can navigate to our web dashboard you need to click on the subsystem button just like the arrow shows you and uh, you will see a page with the subsystems and uh, number of open and fixed findings for them. If you click on any of those links, you will see a sub per subsystem page. It includes some statistics, general information, and a list of all related findings. As I mentioned, we auto obsolete findings that are no longer happening, so hopefully this should all be relevant. Um, and it was actually uh, not so easy to obtain the list of subsystems. There is maintainers file uh, that contains very relevant information, but it's very big, almost 3,000 entries, and it has very long titles. It's not the medium-sized list of tag-like tag -like names we were looking for, um, but with a simple trick, we managed to 
obtain that shortlist. We group maintainer records by mailing list and attempt to extract the subsystem name from that mailing list. It works in almost all cases. There were a few exceptions we had to manually fix. But as a result, we got 238 subsystems with names we wanted. So we also generate the list of rules that map every subsystem to the list of regular expressions for source code paths that's taken from maintainers. And Sysbot ma will match them against stack traces for crashes. And we take relevant crashes, relevant calls from reproducers. Overall algorithm is straightforward. We take X stop crash reports for every bug, extract subsystems for every crash, and aggregate the results. I will not go into much many details here to save time. If you're interested, you can uh, download the presentation and click on the link. You will see more details there. Um, okay, in general, uh, from what I see, the quality looks reasonably good. Uh, there are, of course, uh, some false positives, and due to subsystem classification relying on other functionality that's also not 100% reliable. Um, but it works. And of course, uh, currently we have implemented it like we saw it should be, but of course, you know better. So please, if uh, you think there should be more <coughs> system, you think we should should classify differently, please let us know. Uh, okay. uh, the next section is the bug analysis functionality that uh, Sysbot has seen this year. And let's look at this simple example. So suppose we have found a bug on a, an LTS kernel. We have found a reproducer for it. We run this reproducer on the head of the mainline tree. It does not crash the mainline tree. We run it on the head of the LTS, it crashes the LTS tree. So what are what can it mean? There can be several situations. Um, one of them is that the bug was present in the mainline tree. It got duplicated when the LTS was created. It got fixed in the mainline tree but the fix did not reach LTS. In that case, you would see exactly the same behavior. Mainline, not crashes, not crashing, LTS crashes. It can also be that uh, the bug appeared in the LTS branch as a result of some unfortunate sequence of uh, cherry picks. It's more unlikely, but still possible. And of course we must uh, also assume there can be errors during this procedure. But hopefully it's only a very, very small share. So Sysbot has begun to perform this analysis automatically <coughs> for its findings in LTS trees. And here you can see uh, the current results, the results as of, as of October. For uh, some bugs, uh, did not get classified because they were, did not have a reproducer. But out of those that were classified for 5.15, around one third of what we found uh, got an LTS on the label. For 6.1, the situation is better. Uh, it's about one quarter. So if you download the presentation, you may follow the links, you will see the actual list of bugs. And uh, if we can detect issues that are only present on LTS, we can also try to find the missing backwards for bugs that are really missing the backboard. Uh, that is, if we, we have a mainline tree, we can check that if the reproducer crashes the kernel at the point where LTS tree diverged, and we know that it doesn't crash on some later commit, we can perform a bisection to find the actual commit that should fix the bug. And Sysbot has also started doing that. Um, so far, we have accumulated, I think, around 100 
uh, such commits that need to be recorded I have analyzed some of them and um, here are the results so for 5.15 uh, 65 percent were correctly identified for 6.1 it was 81 percent Interesting, though maybe not so interestingly, uh, almost none of those commits had a fixed stack, which is probably why they were not backported in the first place. Uh, and what were those commits? 64% uh, of them were actual bug fixes. Um, around 20% were various refactorings and optimizations that did not seem to have bug fixing at their main purpose, but as a result, they still fixed the bugs. Um, and uh, smaller shares of issues were commits that f corrected in invalid uh, assertions in the code. So basically, there was no bug, but the kernel was incorrectly claiming that there is. And uh, kernel feature deprecations. We are uh, currently trying to establish a procedure for actually uh, sending requests to backport those commits. Uh, okay, and here's the last section. Um, this year, as I mentioned, there have been uh, quite a few interesting discussions on mailing lists uh, around various aspects of SysBot operation. So let's look at the um, most common uh, themes that were seen in those discussions. Um, the first one is uh, discussions around SysBot sending reports in all the kernel code that's either unmaintained or known to be very buggy or uh, that code that will soon be deprecated or for findings that are not really perceived as bugs by the kernel community. And the usual contra argument was that okay, if, even if the code is to be deprecated and or known to be very bad, but it's still in the kernel and it's still compiled in by many distributions, and is it correct to ignore problems in it? And uh, discussions got yeah very big and sometimes heated, and it of course should not go on that way. And now we're implementing a compromise solution. Uh, we do not report uh, such findings anymore to the mailing lists, but we do display them on the web dashboard with a special tag so so that you can filter them out if you do not want to see them. Mm, another uh, theme is uh, SysBot sending low severity and low priority reports. And uh, it's hard to argue. Not every SysBot report, report is about some fundamental problem in the kernel code. Uh, but unfortunately, at least at this point, uh, the bot cannot really automatically prioritize these findings. To somehow address the problem, there are now two new SysBot commands. One of them can set priority for the issue so that you can filter issues by priorities on the web dashboard. And the other one excludes finding from monthly reporting. And if you see any repetitive cases of such reports, uh, please let us know. And here are also a few ways uh, that we can help SysBot and SysColor and actually any other coverage guided fuzzing tool to get find more interesting problems. If SysColor has more descriptions of the target, target subsystems interface, it will be able to generate more meaningful programs that go deeper into the code. Also, sometimes it happens that kernel crashes um, not very deep into the call stack. So we do not really get to exercise the complicated code. So once these problems are resolved, the fuzzer can go deeper. And of course, it really helps when assertions are implemented with care. So for example, worn on and bug on should not really be used for validating user input. They should only be used for situations that should never happen. And then all kernel automation will be happy. Um, it is also possible to 
find out how deep Syscaller has managed to get into the kernel code, we provide coverage reports on our web dashboard. So if you want to see one, navigate to the, our main page and click on one of the links in the coverage column, just like the arrow shows you. It might get you some idea of what we are exercising and what we can exercise with some little effort. Uh, another big problem is maintainer burnout. And of course, it is much, much more fundamental problem and uh, it's not just CISBAT. Um, but still the question is, what can CISBAT do to make the situation better, at least from, from its side? And one of the possible ways uh, to improve the situation is to try to ship let kernel fuzzing. That is to fuzz incoming patch series and so that we could find problems in them before they are merged. The earlier problems are found, the less time maintainer has to spend later trying to figure out what went wrong. Um, there is lightweight approach possible, uh, that is not to do actual fuzzing, but at least apply the incoming patch, <clears throat> build the instrumented kernel and run the corpus of sysbot generated programs against it. It has a pretty good coverage of the kernel. And hopefully it can catch some not too difficult to trigger problems very easily, but it needs to be evaluated. And uh, last big issue are various false positives that appear in multiple places. Can be invalid by section results, incorrectly inferred subsystems, incorrectly merged reports, not fully minimized reproducers, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, some false positives are always to expect with automation. Um, so we try to focus on eliminating whole classes of, of false positives. Uh, if you have, so yeah, if you notice any repetitive cases, please let us know. And uh, also while some of the false positives are purely our guilt and can, all, can only be fixed by us, in some cases we really need help from the kernel itself. Because in the end, kernel bugs are detected by kernel itself and syscaller just stress tests the kernel to trigger those problems. <coughs> So any improvements to the kernel's bug detection benefit everybody, not just this color. Um, and uh, another use, way the kernel can really help others is by providing options to uh, disable dangerous functionality or um, dangerous kernel interfaces. For example, there is kernel conflict that disables access to slash dev slash mem device so that for us it means that this bot is sure not to mangle kernel uh, computers memory directly and uh, the, the recent examples uh, big thanks to Yankara for um, the patch series that will that we have already enabled and that should eliminate a big class of undesired file system reports Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, a small reminder, uh, right after this presentation, there will be a BOS session uh, related to how to make these board reports easier to debug. So if you have any experience to share or any ideas, please uh, come visit the session. Your feedback is, is very, very helpful in making the tool better. Again, once again, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Uh, is there a way to tell like root versus non-root bugs? Because like writing to DevM, hopefully that's root only. Uh, you mean bugs which require, which, which, whose reproducers require root to trigger it? Exactly. Uh, not at this moment, but it's an interesting suggestion. Uh, so you mentioned the maintainer burnout problem. And I agree it exists, but one of the issues that causes burnout is by sending bug reports, not patches. So what we need is an automated way of turning Sysbot reports into actual patches. 
Now, I'm told that various things like AI can actually do this, but uh, we can smile now, but it's about time we actually tried. Because I can bet my bottom dollar that a maintainer gets stressed by a bug report, especially when everybody else says, yeah, I ran into that bug too, why haven't you fixed it? They get a lot less stressed by patches. So if we could do something to try and actually turn the reports into patches, I mean, even if it's just a team at uh, Google actually looking through the reports and saying, you know, set a, set a bunch of interns on it and see if they can produce patches, that will actually help to reduce the stress. Because you can say, here's a patch found by Sysbot. We didn't even send you the report because we sent you the patch instead. Thank you. Uh, I have heard about researchers uh, trying to find some ways to auto-generate these uh, huh? fixes for, uh, actually, for Sysbot box. But uh, I don't know if how maintainers would be really happy to see a lot of wrong patches. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, but but <laughs> but have you tried uh, you bisect to something and then you revert it, rebuild, and then see if the problem goes away? If a simple revert would fix the problem? Um, no, we haven't tried that yet. Yeah, but that you, you could so be. Then you can help. Help eliminate some false positives. Yeah. So uh, another uh, right here, right here. Yeah, another question, but actually uh, um, a suggesting. Um, I was uh, looking at some of the things you said were problems that could be solved, and um, I think the first step would be to differentiate which of those issues are CSPOT specific, and which ones are inherent to CI uh, by nature. So, for example. There was uh, your uh, um, kernel configs uh, applied by Sysbot causes some kernel revisions not to boot or not to build correctly. So that's something that's specific to Sysbot and something that can be tackled at first, maybe. But there are some other things about, um, for example, bisections leading not to the cause of the bug, but to the commit that made it made the crash surface. That's, that I think there's not a lot you can do about that. That's basically how bisection works. And sometimes it's like that. And then you get to investigate where the root cause is, but maybe you can leave that for uh, later. Maybe those kind of problems can be tackled in a more generic way instead of trying to you know, address it themselves, uh, address them yourself. What I'm trying to say is try to find the low hanging fruit first uh what can be improved by Sysbot and which issues are common to great work by the way i think uh you're doing great with Sysbot. it works very well i think it's it's a, indeed a very fruitful point of view yeah, to differentiate issues we can fix and uh, that are related to kernel but the one you mentioned about uh kernel not building and not booting with sysbot configs. I think it's not really sysbot's fault because it's not that uh, by sysbot config, I meant the normal Linux config, but just with the options we normally enable. And I think the kernel is expected to still be able to build and boot with different config combinations, but unfortunately it's not yeah. always. Yeah, there, might, there might be needed to do some work there to address uh, configuration dependencies to avoid these kind of situations, yes. So uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I read a blog post by uh, Google Open Fuzz on uh, their use usage of LLMs to generate the harnesses, not the code, but the harnesses to do the fuzzing. Mm -hmm. um, is, is any of that work like available to you to start to try and like increase the amount of coverage? Uh, yeah use our own language for defining these descriptions, which mm -hmm. describe what system calls there are, what data structures they expect, what fields and the rest. Just we try to experiment with LLMs, like uh, here is the kernel code, um, please write uh, so syscaller descriptions, but so far the results are not very promising. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is interesting. Uh, how much, uh, right now, system calls are covered and some IOC calls. What else are you working on? What uh, what parts of the kernel interface are, are, are un, un, 
un, uh, document, I guess, on un, un whatever covered? Uh, to be honest, we ourselves have, there's well, there was very little time left for actually working on this. Uh, descriptions for kernel interfaces so it remains uh, it grows by contributions from outside mostly and uh, we have a special issue on uh, github that lists all big uncovered chunks of the kernel what you like mm, not sure i can uh, list some <laughs> by heart but there are many of the Kernel. Actually, we do not cover much of the kernel, so there is a lot more work to be done. And we provide these coverage reports where you can actually see all the kernel code and see what blocks of code are covered and what are not. It can be a very good guidance in understanding what is done and what should be done. Yes, sure. No other questions? Uh, and this one. So uh, another suggestion would be if you looking somewhere, like LLM would be in that direction, but uh, something simpler. If you get some backtrace in some class of, of uh, let's say, a driver, and then you look at the previous fixes and say, oh, maybe this is related to the same kind of fix that uh, that's like classes of bugs that you could, instead of just pointing the problem by secting, um, suggest that look at that previous fix that may be related. It's interesting. At least on our web dashboard, we try to display similar issues, at least those that crap that uh, appear that have similar backtraces and that were already closed or fixed, so you can find it. So thank you very much.